a sudden supply of paper. And when you had paper, then you could have writing, and writing could circulate. Uh, and one of the things that got retrieved was a whole lot of manuscripts from antiquity. Uh, so these suddenly came to light, courtesy of the Arabs. Uh, and Aquinas, among others, but Aquinas particularly, got interested in formal cause, uh, as well as the other three. Uh, so there's that part of the story. Uh, in my own study, I tried to simply to do one job, and that is to ascertain exactly what it was my father found in formal cause and the other causes that was germane to study of media. Uh, so I went at Aristotle. I had to relearn Greek, <laughs> uh, which I'd mostly forgotten. Uh, but I got into Aristotle, and I discovered a bit of a mess, largely created by translators. Uh, and translators weren't too certain about formal cause because Aristotle wasn't too clear about it. He had two <laughs> ideas about it. Um, and then matters got a lot muddier when philosophers took it up. They can make mud pies out of just about anything. Uh, what's that old line from Harry Balafati? It was clear as mud, but it covered the ground. <laughs> uh, and the, the philosophers decided that, uh, by and large, that final cause is the aspiration that you aim at and that it's the last piece of the chain of efficient causes. And that isn't final cause at all. If that were true, then final cause would be an effect. And it's not. It's a cause. There are two of the causes, formal, efficient, material, and final. Two of the causes operate inside time. Two of them operate outside of linear time. The two that operate inside time are efficient cause. It's absolutely sequential. And material cause, because materials are mutable. They change over time. They decay or they mature. Uh, but the other two, formal and final, are a little outside of that. They're in synchronic time, not diachronic. Okay? So final cause, here's the funny thing, you see, final cause is there from the outset. It's not at the end, it's right there from the very beginning. Uh, and it acts as a cause in a rather mysterious way. I'm not going to go into that now, but I'll, it's good to be clear on some of these. Two of the causes are concerned with being. Two of them are concerned with becoming. And guess what? Being and becoming are the foundation of metaphysics. Um, so formal cause has to do with being. The definition, the entelechy, the being of whatever the subject is. Final cause also. Uh, I came to... I was sort of persuaded after working on this thing for a couple of years that Aristotle arrived at final cause as a sort of homage to Plato. Plato had invented the ideas, the ideal form. Uh, and so for Plato, the ideal is an archetype. For Aristotle, the ideal, the final cause, is a cliché. A cliché, and as we know from that wonderful study from cliché to archetype, uh, ye old archetype, no, what is it? New archetype is the old cliché writ large. So Aristotle was flipping that around, and he, <clears throat> well, he had trouble with final cause as well, but he was on the dividing line between two states of mind, two conditions of the imagination. Uh, and he had one foot in one area and one foot in the other. Plato, too, had this problem. He, said he apparently uh, arrived in Athens 
as a street corner mime. He was a Corregos. Uh, and so he had some of that old preliterate sensibility, and he knew how to work that side of the street. But he was more interested as a philosopher, a dialectician, in abstract thought, not participatory thought. And um, dialectic is all about the word in the mind, before speech. Uh, and most people who aren't literate will tell you, well, how can you think without speaking? How many of you think in words? How many of you think in images? There really is a sort of dividing line there. Fifty years ago, if you'd asked an audience that, how many think in words? Almost all hands go up. And the ones that didn't were, well, many of them artists, one or another ilk. Um, the balance, male and female, thinking in images or thinking in words was decidedly on the male side. But beginning in the 70s and all through the 80s and right up to this time, you say, how many of you think in images? A few hands sort of trembling. How many of you think in images? They all go up. We changed our way of thinking, our, the way we orchestrate our sensibilities. And this change is reflected in um, the balance of the causes and how we think. So we have two causes to do with being and two causes to do with becoming. Um, in a nutshell, a uh, formal cause is, um, what did I say here? Oh, yeah. Uh, my father subtitled Understanding Media, The Extensions of Man. Uh, the Extensions of Man is a statement of etymology. The etymology of our technologies is the user. The fork is a wonderful example. The etymology of the fork is right here. The fork has tines, it has a little palm, and it has an arm, a forearm. It's modeled after the human body. Um, and thanks for that, by the way, Corey, it's very useful. <laughs> um, so the user, in this case, is the formal cause, provides the form. In fact, the user is always the formal cause. Uh, the, the formal cause of an advertisement is the audience. And they are very, very pointed. They're aimed straight at this guy. They've got all sorts of statistics. Uh, and uh, numbers, uh, they can describe the user, the audience, the person they're aiming at down to the last detail. Uh, but you, and, and this, by the way, is exactly what Paul is doing in the philosophy of composition. That, that particular essay is dead center classical rhetoric, not Aristotle. Aristotle's a dialectician, and his rhetoric is of practically no use to real rhetorician. Uh, the real rhetorician, the Ciceronian rhetorician, begins with the audience. And there's a whole division of rhetoric, elocutio, uh, devoted to tailoring what you're doing to that audience. Uh, and Poe is giving you a chapter and verse on exactly how he tailored the poem, the raven, to uh, his reader and the effect he wanted to produce. The effect the advertiser wants to produce is not to wake you up and, and charge your intellect with thoughts and, and, and liven. No, he wants you to be asleep uh, because you're better, more easily led that way. He wants you to buy. So this is part of the, dif the difference between the PR man and the advertiser. The PR man cares a lot about what you think about the company, the company's <coughs> image, and so on. The advertiser doesn't give a damn about that. Think what you like, buy. 
They're each different. There's a lot of gray overlap and so on, but essentially that's the difference. So the advertiser is working with formal costs. He wants to change you from someone who doesn't buy into someone who does buy. That's a modification of being. The PR man cares what you think. He wants to change your mind. The advertiser wants to change you. One is becoming, the other is being. Um, formal cause, a couple of uh, um, synonyms for formal cause. And they've been brought up here uh, in a somewhat overlapping manner. Another, another word for formal cause is ground. Is what? Ground. Figure and ground. The ground is the formal cause of the figure. Mm -hmm. The way the sea is the formal cause of the shape of the island. As the sea changes, the island changes. As the ground changes, the figure changes. Uh, another word for formal cause is medium. And that's why <coughs> Marshall McLuhan was interested in this. It's the only kind of causality that uses the environment as a cause. When he said the medium is the message, he's saying the environment is the message of the new thing. There are a couple of paradoxes here. The environment is always a side effect of the figure. Uh, exactly the way, for example, the uh, what do we say the side effect of the motor car is the road. But here's the paradox: the road has to be there in order for the formal cause, for the uh, figure, the car, to be imaginable. <coughs> it's outside time. The effect comes first, then comes the car. The road is first, then the car. What do you call, uh, let's say, two, two baseball teams get together, uh, the athletics and the giants, okay. they have a ball game, and there's nobody in the stands. What do you call that? A practice. Add the audience, it's a ball game. Without the audience, it's a practice. The audience is the ground. All right. Um, so, yeah, okay. He's saying it's time to cut it off. <laughs> it's time to hear from the formal cause. Yes, I think so. I think so. <laughs> Darn, well, we're just getting warmed up here. Thing, real quick, I just want to clarify <laughs> oh. this. I, I, th I, I'm not, I don't want to be accused of being anomalous. I think there's a difference <laughs> between natural kinds of things and classification. But I'm going to add uh, just to the last real quickly. I, 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 the difficulty is that not all patterns are formal cause. Mm -hmm. Okay. Let's hear from the formal okay. cause. All right. Mm -hmm. All right, yeah. yeah. Quick question. How does the uh, whole concept of affordances fit into this analysis? Affordances? Affordances? Yeah. Gibson sort of stuff. Um, like a computer, you have to, it, yeah. it gives you clues about how to use it so that the computer teaches its users how to perform with it. And, and the, you know, the, in design the technologies, you right. design the affordances. Uh, they're uh, successful. Mm -hmm. uh, and it, it originates in J.J. Gibson's work on perception so that uh, you have the environment that's out there, um, and in, in that conceptualization, the medium is what we, through which we perceive the environment, so it would be, say, the air and the light, that's the medium, um, which I, I think that understanding from, um, is actually real, um, very important to uh, to understand why McLuhan, why Marshall McLuhan put so much emphasis on sense perception, because there's this older tradition of the medium as the, the way in which we perceive things. But then uh, affordances are our perception of what the environment can, uh, can uh, offer us, or, but, but it's both positive and negative. What the, I mean, that's the, to use the same word, what the environment affords us, either as a benefit or a threat. Um, 
And then that was picked up, I think Dan Norman picked it up to talk about design. You know, so if you think about the technology as being out in the environment, um, and then what does the user perceive about the, uh, the technology? Um, how do you design it so that they recognize what the technology does or, or what it can do, it, its affordances? I, I think, so I think it got picked up in a more superficial sense uh, by a lot of people where they just, and, and, and it mostly refers then to what a technology does. Um, its uses, in, in, in a way, as opposed to its effects. Because um, affordances really doesn't speak to effects. It's just what it has to offer us. Um, and, and one thing that people then tend to leave out was that Dan Norman, uh, in, in addition to affordances, talking, also talked about constraints, which comes from Bates. And, you know, how does the technology or the environment constrain our ability to act in, in certain ways. Um, and that's just as important or in many ways that the argument coming from folks like Bateson and Deacon would be that the constraints and the absences are more significant. This relates to gaps and intervals in McLuhan's uh, view. That's more significant than in a sense the positive point about what it <coughs> affords us. I don't know if that answers your question, but uh, is it so important? Let's to have other people. Okay, sorry. <laughs> Bob, I'm chairing this, excuse me. <laughs> You're excused. I'm sorry. <laughs> oh, oh, that's okay. Well, uh, entertain other questions, please. That's fine. Okay, yeah. Uh, well, it's coming out of a uh, Eastern uh, perspective. I was just wondering if there's been any consideration of uh, any of these ideas showing up in other traditions. Uh, what immediately jumped out at me was the Buddhist idea of Pratitya Samutpada. Uh, which implies that when one thing comes into existence simultaneously, there's another thing implied by that thing, and so there's sort of a, uh, a trans individual consciousness, which also reminded me that the idea of the audience as um, the reason for something. If we looked at nature and patterns, there's the idea in Samkhya philosophy of formal cause pre existing in the material cause, kind of a, uh, a trans a temporal, as uh, McLuhan was saying here, uh, Eric was saying about the uh, timeless aspect of uh, formal and final cause. And uh, in, in that system, there's uh, an idea called Purusharta, Purusha, spirit, Prakriti is matter, and Prakriti acts for the, ship, for the sake of Purusha, Purusharta. So I just noticed a similarity. Yeah, I, mean, I, I, I can't follow up exactly on some of the more technical things there, but I think sort of what you're getting at, and this is this question of being and becoming, is I think one of the ways to reframe that and why formal cause looks to be outside of time is try to think of triangles to you know, draw a lot of triangles. We could just keep drawing them, but the form of the triangle is actually outside of time. So when we're doing the different, you know, when we're cutting the different angles on the, the triangle, it's not that particular one, but we mean the, the essence of the triangle. So there's a sense in which, and this goes back to the form substance thing, I mean, I think the form does seem to be outside of time because the particulars we're dealing with in substance are always less than that whole that we mean sort of behind the scenes or outside of the contingencies of the particulars. Just as far as other traditions, I have seen a kind of reference in Martin Buber and uh, again, Adina Karasik's chapters on the Kabbalah um, connecting it to formal cause. So I mean, I think it's wide open for, for that kind of thing. So I would, I would encourage you to write an article on that topic. Yeah, there's why I'm very joyous in it. Yeah. The ignorance that lifts the wise impression that lifts the voice that finds the least thankful. I'm sorry, Andrew, did I call him? Uh, I no, New York's not the center. Um, that conveys the context that sweetens the sensation that drives desire that adheres to attachment. So, yeah, and why not with fun, but you know, applied choice. So, yeah. Okay. Mm, sorry, <laughs> Bob, was that okay? Tom, yeah, that was great. Thank you. Nice to hear from the audience. Tom? <laughs> uh, for Eric, then. If the milieu is the environment, and the environment is the formal cause. What would uh, Marshall do with the, uh, the, the milieu divine, the, the divine milieu of Taylor? I'd have to think about that before giving an answer. I don't know. Okay. That's a good one. Jerry? Yeah. And along with 
Andrew said some bun bunch of babble to me. That was uh, from Winning in Spake by James Joyce, as he said, it's applied Joyce. 81-1. Say it again? 81-1. Way to go. So is uh, this my producers are my consumers? Hmm. It's a line from Fitting and Wake? Yes, How is. does that apply to what you just said? Oh, that's cool. Oh, well, that's fine. The, uh, uh, that's, that's again saying the audience is is the form of cause. Yeah. Oh, just uh, an observation and uh, an anecdote from, from McLuhan that connects your notion of uh, uh, the pattern that connects and the pattern that directs the story of the Boy Scout and the Nun. Do you remember that? At least oh, for the audience. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> a Boy Scout helps the Nun cross the street. Oh, no problem. Any friend of Batman is Which doesn't work so well anymore. Right? <laughs> <laughs> but it connects on the direct. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah, I know. <laughs> Thank you, Paul. Lance? Lance? Yeah. I make two little points. Yeah. Okay. Um, I do have a chapter, an essay, in a book on technological determinism in Marshall McLuhan. did actually write one. It's in the book, Electric Language. It's been out of print for a while, but there are copies floating around. I have one. Yes, Bob has one. Of course you do. <laughs> uh, the second is Laws of Media. I discovered when writing the essay on formal cause that the laws of media are an analytic of formal cause. And the laws of media, this picks up one of your points, the laws of media are actually there for the purpose of prediction. Purpose of? That's it. Prediction. Yeah. Prediction. So formal cause is prediction. Thank you. <laughs> well, I mean, I, I'd like to just add one little point, too, <laughs> since you... Um, that going back to Aristotle, and this, this is in Je Jeremy Campbell is a nice little book, Grammatical Man. Grammatical Man. It's, it's kind of popular, um, but uh, it, it actually brings in, it's mo mostly about information theory and systems connecting into language, and then at the end gets into final causality more so. But he points out that Aristotle was very much a biologist. I mean, of course, he famously created the first great taxonomy of all life, of all uh, life forms. Um, and in the, by the same token, systems theory um, represents a turn away from mechanistic physics, which is sort of very inorganic and, and machine-like, to an ecological and organic view of the world, you know, one that takes into account evolution. And connecting to that, I would also like to say, we don't talk about him enough, but Walter Ong yeah. was in many ways a biologist, and in fact, um, what part of his early work involved <coughs> introducing evolution to the church, you know, in a way that, um, I guess, he succeeded, perhaps, where Teilhard de Chardin uh, wasn't able to succeed. And, and, and I think that's very, very significant, that uh, media ecology is grounded in a scientific view of the world and, and, one, and is consistent with a biological understanding. It's, it is the extensions of the human body. You have to senses, you have to know biology to really understand these things. But, but can I just say that, I mean, I think this is where an interesting tension comes in between the tetrads and formal cause, because I, as I'm understanding both you and Bob, in some way, the problem with the tetrads is that the retrieval implies that it's always already there. And the emergence issue kind of cuts against that grain. Okay. Having the shortest presentation, I will ask a question of Eric. Oh. <laughs> you said, I believe final cause is an effect. It's the effect that you want to create. And there's a certain flip here. Mm -hmm. So. I'm not saying that what you, you said is not true, but I'm saying that in addition, one can think of the final cause as an effect you want to create. <coughs> so when we talk about reversal of cause and effect, the final cause is the effect that you want to create, and then you 
use the causes of material, efficient, and formal to achieve the effect you want to create, your reaction. Is that a, co a question? Yeah, that was a question. Yeah, okay. Your reaction. No. That's still not a question. Come back to the what name. Final cause. Your... It's a cause. Uh, it may be an objective or a goal, but it's a cause. And the cause, final cause, is there at the very beginning, not at the end. So all effects are then causes. No. Yes, the, no. the effect of the telegraph was ah. the cause of the telephone. Let's put it this way. Formal cause is enter entirely composed of side effects. I, I just to say, I think another way to look at it is that cause the, the four causes are not isolatable, mm -hmm. um, except mm -hmm. in, in, you know, conceptually, but in reality, they all, they're all present. They're subsets of cause rather than separate causes that existed independently. And that's the way, you know, I think that's the proper way to understand. But for Aristotle, agree? not all four are present for all things. Well, I don't know. Sure. Would you agree that they are? No. No. That's not what I'm <laughs> <laughs> Never mind. That's incorrect. But it's, you know, this is the kind of thing that has to go on with something new. You've got to try it on everything in sight and see what it works with and what it doesn't. I want to claim Aristotle was a systems thinker because he said uh, the whole is more than the sum of its parts. Yeah. So he's a little bit towards a uh, systems way of thinking. I think he used the word heap. <coughs> <laughs> and then James Joyce uses midden heap. Yes. And so from the heap, from the midden heap, comes new things. Mm -hmm. W. B. Yeats also said the uh, matrix of innovation is a junkyard. Junkyard, I think, are the last words that we should hear. <laughs> <laughs> This is on the walls.